so that um, we can play it back later if necessary. All this will, as we'll discuss later, be available online and in other various uh, formats for folks to watch back and enjoy uh, and participate in uh, later on. But um, again, welcome, sincerest thanks. My name is Mikey Guralnik. Um, hopefully, uh, my voice will serve as an identifier because we're going to keep everybody's video cameras off for the duration of the presentation in the evening or late afternoon, as the case may be, um, to ensure a free, a more kind of effective bandwidth for everybody. Um, and I should mention, uh, probably goes without saying, that it's a huge bummer that we're not all able to do this together and be in a, a room to have these important conversations and, and, um, and, and share this important information and be together talking about the river trail, but uh, hopefully someday soon and uh, hopefully the, the go-to meeting format will suffice for now. Um, but uh, this is the second installment of the community speaker and engagement series for the Merced River Trail. Um, just looking through the attendee list, definitely a lot of familiar faces or at least names from uh, the first presentation. And no worries if you weren't at the first one, uh, we'll, we'll catch you up. But um, just a reminder that this is uh, part lecture and discussion where we'll have a presentation from uh, a very notable uh uh, local expert in an issue or topic or theme that is uh, relevant and um, hopefully compelling to you all uh, related to the Merced River corridor and the river trail and the, the sense of place and um, all the special things that make it uh, a great place that we all care about so much. Uh, and then afterwards, we'll discuss uh, a community planning exercise um, which uh, in this case will be something that we kind of com that you all complete uh, after the meeting, but um, is something that is intended to uh, collect feedback and input and ideas on the Merced River Trail project. Um, so that project, just to give you a, a brief overview, um, is uh, a trail, a multi-use, non-motorized trail along the historic rail grade on the north side of the Merced River from Bagby uh, to El Portal. Um, and then a what happens uh, so and 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 at some point uh, it'll enter Yosemite National Park. But what's really important for me to emphasize, and uh, probably haven't done a good enough job of emphasizing this in the past, is that the actual route of the trail is something that we're here to discuss, uh, and something that we're getting feedback from you all from um, have been getting feedback from folks from throughout the planning process and. We'll continue to get uh, feedback from people um, as the planning process uh, continues. Uh, and certainly one area that I um, realized a lot of folks are, are, um, are interested in, in knowing more about or they certainly have strong feelings about and are interested in sharing those feelings with us later uh, is the, the, the trail's um, route or alignment or character through the communities of El Portal and Foresta and, and its connection with Yosemite. And those are... Um, all things that are totally on the table and that we're uh, looking forward to uh, getting people's input and ideas and direction on uh, throughout the course of the project. Um, the planning process to date has really been, so I'm, I work for the county, as I mentioned, uh, but, uh, and I'm just going to need everybody, if, you're, if my mute all command did not work, if you could please make sure to mute your microphones, that would be great. Uh, so yeah, as I was saying, uh, the county is involved in this planning project, um, and we are uh, lucky to be guided by and supported by volunteers from the community who comprise the Merced River Trail Community Working Group. Uh, their names are here, um, and many of them, if not all of them, are currently on this phone call. Um, as you can see, some members have uh, joined and left throughout the course of the last year, but there are nine voting members uh, and two non-voting members. And this group's role is really to um, connect the county to uh, the county, the county, uh, so the county government to, and county staff like myself to county residents like you all, uh, and make sure that our planning process is um, is transparent and equitable and uh, is effectively engaging with the folks who who are most affected by and care most about uh, the trail and the river and the river canyon and our county's landscape in general. Um, so this group has been really instrumental, really has done the lion's share of the work uh, in help
helping to devise the planning process uh, and certainly the stakeholder engagement component of that planning process. Um, which uh, starts with a, um, which starts really broad and uh, is designed to get more and more specific throughout the planning effort. So uh, we'll, we, we start with um, what the project's vision is, so what the highest aspirations the community has for the Minnesota River Trail. Um, once that decision has been made, we get more specific and think about the project's goals. So goals are ways of thinking about how um, uh, the vision that we've identified or articulated or built consensus around can um, be realized. Uh, and once those the project's goals have been determined, we'll um, move on to making uh, more specific recommendations about the actions, the, the projects uh, that are um, the, the most effective and most appropriate ways for realizing or achieving the project's goals. Um, so that's kind of the overall framework for the planning effort. And, um, and we're, we're uh, as I'll discuss a little bit later, um, just in a moment, the, we, we've, we're kind of in the middle here. Um, the, this event and the conversations that we're going to have uh, in the next month or so are really uh, geared towards establishing the project's goal. Just quickly, uh, I'll, I won't read all this, but I'll leave it up here for you all to read. I just want to uh, be, um, uh, be try and be as clear as I can about what the planning process is. So we're we're working uh, with the public uh, through our working group to identify, collect, and organize ideas, which are your ideas and your preferences and your priorities and your with your input. Um, and like I said earlier, uh, this is. Dynamic. There, are, uh, you know, the the everything, including the route of the river trail, or elements of the the alignment of the trail, uh, is is something that's fluid and that we're getting input on actively. And and through this through this events like this, um, uh, getting your thoughts and your your values so that we can make uh, a, a decisions that are reflective of um, a broad and and equitable uh, input from the community. And we're directly and intentionally centering the uh, river trail of outstanding and remarkable values, the rivers of outstanding and remarkable values, um, uh, and the, the wild and scenic conditions <clears throat> and character that are enshrined in federal legislation. Um, what we're not doing is we're not trying to uh, express what the county's internal, um, you know, the government, county staff, the supervisors, we're not trying to find some way to express what it is that we think. Um, we're, again, just trying to facilitate what our intention is to facilitate this process where people can animate it and, um, and, and take advantage of it as a way to uh, share their ideas so that we can codify them. Um, we're not you know, trying to get people to, to sign off on a decision or set of decisions that have already been made. We're, we're again, actively making those decisions throughout the course of our project. Um, and we're not trying to quote unquote develop the Mercer River Trail. Um, development uh, is something that is kind of a sticky word, but um, it's it's you know the the character and the, the quality of any uh, changes that that uh, might be recommended through the final vision document are all things that will be um, you know vetted by and the the, the product of um, community consensus community input and your decisions. So um, if that, I just wanted to make sure that, that that's all super clear uh, and, um, and, and get that out there. So uh, to this point, so as I mentioned, this is uh, for those of you who weren't able to attend the, the first event, this is the second event. So I'll give a, a quick little recap and summary of that first event. Um, so initially back in uh, the B, I guess it was almost exactly a year ago, uh, the community working group had sort of framed out this um, four-part community speaker and engagement series uh, to start in February of 2020 and to unfold with uh, an event like this one every two months. Um, and our, our first event was uh, in, in February uh, at the El Patel Community Hall, where uh, Irene Vasquez gave a presentation on the Native American sense of place uh, as it pertains to the Merced River Trail. And we worked with you all to uh, build consensus around what the project's vision is. So we had this event. There were about 50 people who attended that event. Um, and the attendees uh, at the in person 
participated in this uh, exercise where we presented uh, three draft vision statements, which were um, the product of a lot of uh, conversation and collaboration and dialogue uh, between the community working group members um, at their meetings, which uh, I should mention are um, public meetings that occur on the third Thursday of um, every month. So that I'll, I'll, I can share that information later. But you're welcome to, and people do regularly, uh, people from the public regularly do attend these meetings uh, and listen in. Um, so uh, over a course of a number of meetings, the working group decided on uh, these draft vision statements and at this event and also later online, um, folks uh, kind of edited, marked up, and engaged with the three draft vision statements uh, to come to uh, a, a set of very kind of clear recommendations for the working group to synthesize. And the results of that synthesis were, uh, it are um, this vision statement, um, which uh, I can read. The Merced River Trail will manifest our community's appreciation of our county's ecological, scenic, and cultural resources along the wild and scenic Merced River. It will address the growing needs for education, access to recreation, and regional economic development with the imperative for conserving the canyon's many remarkable resources. The trail will serve as a central connective component of an existing and future network of trails. And again, this is really the product of a synthesis of the input that was collected on the draft vision statements, both at this event uh, in February and um, a number of folks who were able to participate uh, in, conduct in the activity uh, later on online. So this is the project's vision statement, um, and the project vision statement really guides uh, the project's goals. So now that we know what the, our highest aspirations are for the Merced River Trail, we are in a position to get more specific about how we're going to do that. Uh, and that is the premise of um, the engagement exercise that we're going to discuss uh, later on. Um, but uh, so the, the, the schedule for our engagement series is obviously subject to many outside forces. Um, due to the pandemic, we've had to kind of rethink uh, and certainly pause um, on this engagement program that we had initially sketched out last year. Uh, but we're really excited to bring it back to this digital format and, um, again, totally acknowledge its limitations and that it's less than ideal. Um, but uh, we're, we're hoping it's, it's, it's uh, still fun and enjoyable and, uh, and exciting. And also, uh, we'll talk a little bit more later about um, some other opportunities for folks to continue participating and be engaged in this project, even though we're not able to, uh, to be together. So our next, so now we're, we're, we're at the point where we're going to uh, begin our, our community speaker component of our evening. Um, it's my sincerest pleasure to introduce Rob Grasso. Uh, many of you, if not all of you, uh, know about Rob, um, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the introductions to him. Um, and I'm eager to now turn it over to Rob Grasso, who will talk about the ecological identity of the Merced River Corridor. And as that's happening, I wanted to um, remind everybody to keep your microphones muted if you're not already, uh, and let you know that I'll be turning the, if it's not, I think the chat box is already on, but if it's not, I'll, I'll make sure to turn it on. Um, and if you have any questions for the presenter about the topic that he's presenting on, um, that uh, you can go ahead and chat those, and um, I will, we'll do our best to make sure that we answer all of them. Uh, throughout the course of the evening, and it looks like I'm going to pass the presenter baton to you, Rob, and um, let me know if you're able to get your presentation going. Okay, thanks, Mikey. I will Let's see. And uh, you did cut out a couple times, so I might just check in to make sure everybody can still hear me. As we're moving forward, let me know once you can see it. Yeah. I got you. I can see it, and I apologize for the cutting out. It might be my my internet. That's okay. I'm sitting as close to my router as I can, and you might I hear some trumpet playing by my daughter in the background. That I'm hopefully she's on the other side of the house. It's not as clear, but just in case. Uh, okay, title slide come up. Okay. And uh, I apologize if there's a lag. I'll try to keep consistent with the slides, but um, 
morning. Okay, just checking in again. Mikey, can you see the presentation? Yes, sir. Looks great. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, Mikey, and to others in the county for inviting me to, to come speak tonight uh, about the aquatic wildlife in the Merced River Canyon. Um, as uh, I'm Rob Grasso, I'm the park aquatic ecologist for Yosemite National Park. So we deal with a lot of similar species um, that are in the Merced River Canyon that are, are in the park. And I've been asked to sort of give an overview of the aquatic wildlife that are in the River Canyon um, and some, you know, snippets and, you know, why we should care and, and then some considerations at the end and use some examples that I've been involved with on, on both roads and trails projects for for amphibians and other aquatic animals. Um, and then I'll also try to be cognizant of the, of the chat box and um, see questions in there. But if, if questions want to come up at the end, that's fine. Um, I, I'm sure as most are already familiar, the Merced is a, is a wild and scenic river. Um, you know, it's headwaters in the main stem that run through Yosemite Valley um, and most of the South Fork in the tributaries. Um, you know, roughly you can think of wild and scenic rivers as the wild section or, or, or tend to be the, the roadless areas um, and those trying to get the scenic designation. And there's some recreational, you know, changes that go along with that too. But, you know, in total, it's about 120 miles from the park headwater boundaries down to Bagby or, or what they consider the high water mark of, of Lake McClure. And I think the only thing excluded is, is the North Fork is, is not considered part of the wild and scenic designation. And just a map to highlight, you know, that wild and scenic portion and, and most of the area that I'll be discussing the aquatic wildlife um, in this talk this evening is, is roughly from that, that Bagby stretch, um, that high water mark on the reservoir um, up to about the El Portal for rest of area, the boundary of the, the park boundary. And then some portions of the South Fork Merced River as well. And I think most of the designation came, I think it was 87 with some additions in the early nineties to the, the wild and scenic designation. And, um, you know, starting sort of at the lower, I guess, evolutionary side of the aquatic animal, um, food web, um, starting with invertebrates. Um, our, our most notable is probably the Western pearl shell mussel, Margaritifera falcata. Um, this was previously unknown in the Merced River region. The only known occurrence of the Western pearl shell mussel was down near Snelling and almost to the confluence with the San Joaquin um, in the Merced River system. It was, I was actually out with my family snorkeling in the river when I first discovered them in the river and nobody seemed to know their prior history. So um, they are an excellent indicator of water quality. Most species in this genera are declining throughout the West and across the US. Um, there are other species back East that have very obligate hosts that are, that are doing well. And, you know, they're notable that they can live up to a hundred years. Um, they're not like saltwater mussels that have bissel threads and attached to rocks. These guys are more like clams that can kind of move around in the substrate and change their location. Um, I have a really interesting uh, Glochidia life stage, which the mussel actually um, will flicker out an attractant. And when a fish comes in close proximity and bites what it thinks looks like a worm or some kind of an, uh, other invertebrate, the mussel expels these Glochidia and they're like little Pac-Men that clasp on to the gill rakers of fish and they become parasitic for a few days. And that's largely how they disperse um, in the river. They'll attach to the fish's gills as the fish moves. Um, the glochidia, the larval stages of the mussel, need to be need to have this parasitic like burst of blood, and then um, transition to a new spot in the river. So, you know, it's a good sign that they're here. Some have argued that maybe they came in with hatchery fish. Um, most rivers in the state, certainly within the San Joaquin and Sacramento tributaries have Western pearl shell mussels. Um, I would give it, you know, it's probably they were always here, but maybe in lower abundance. And then as water quality has been improving, um, their abundance maybe has now taken more notice or center stage. And, and our, our most, you know, infamous um, non-native invertebrate species here, or notorious, I should say, 
is the um, signal crayfish. And there's a lot of um, a lot of introductions of crayfish in, in California. We only have a few natives. Some are already lost. The, the Shasta crayfish being one, and the Klamath signal crayfish being the other. Um, but most of the experts agree that our crayfish in the Merced River and throughout California likely originated in the Columbia River Basin and are, and are non-native. Um, largely introduced as a food source um, and as bait. Um, they're easily transferable in a bucket with very little water and survive for days. So, um, you know, people like them for that reason to move them around. Uh, we first noted them in Yosemite Valley in about 1975. And it's likely that they could have spread to downstream sources um, or been introduced to places like McClure and spread upstream from the reservoir. Um, they eat almost anything, um, detritus, eggs, small invertebrates, um, specifically dragonfly larvae is one of their favorites and um, very aggressive. So push out a lot of other native species um, in rivers. And their abundance seems to be related to river flows. So high pulses may pulse them out, um, but downstream reservoirs that usually act as hosts, um, you know, allow them to recolonize upstream areas. Next, sort of uh, moving into the native fishes, I'm not covering all the species in the river just due to time, but if there are questions about other things like um, riffle sculpins or, or um, hitches or roaches, I'm happy to talk about them. I figured I would just touch upon some of our most common species. Um, the Sacramento sucker being probably the most common species um, in the river, Catastomus occidentalis. There are um, Pretty general, they feed on mostly detritus and bottom feeding. Um, they're tolerant of a wide range of river conditions, so they persist in droughts. They're able to weather out high flows. Um, you know, when um, sediment gets into the river, they tolerate it pretty well. They grow to a size of about 20 inches. And if you see schools of fish in the river, um, you know, with kind of these hatch mark patterns on their back, they're most likely. Um, Sacramento sucker that you're observing and they're pretty easy to identify if you're underwater. They have the, the downturned mouth, um, kind of like a placostomous catfish or something that is used to sucking on rocks to get the detritus um, or the paraphyton or algae off the rocks. So they're easily identifiable, identifiable by their mouth parts. Um, and just going to check in that audio is still okay. Yeah, sounds great. Okay, it looks like I hit a bit a little bit of lag trying to get to my next slide. So let me. Okay, I have a frozen screen, so bear with me. No worries. Okay. Are you seeing the head minnow slide yeah. next? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Perfect. So Myloferidon concephalus um, is another interesting, it's considered a forest service sensitive species, um, historically abundant, but now um, getting rarer, but luckily pretty common in the Merced River. Uh, they're a large omnivorous minnow. They reach almost two feet. So for the minnow family, this is a pretty large fish. Um, they're relatively long lived, about 10 years, um, prefer deeper pools, clear, slow moving water. Um, and they can migrate quite long distances in rivers to spawn. And popular areas to see these are in the McClendon's Beach area. You can find hardhead. They're common uh, just below the gorge um, and probably range all the way down to the reservoir, but it's, they're probably one of our more sensitive species. Um, Forest Service, um, when they designated them as a, as a forest sensitive species, that was probably due to a lot of water quality um, issues from sediment and from erosion getting into rivers. So they're a little bit sensitive to that water quality. A very similar looking species <clears throat> is the Sacramento pike minnow, um, the Kayakiles grandis. These guys are a little bit easier to identify by their mouth. Um, they're probably our biggest or largest predatory native fish year round resident in the rivers. Um, and again, they're kind of easily identifiable by their, their large mouth. Um, you know, they would be equivalent to, you know, a bass on the East Coast as, as our, you know, sort of larger, more aggressive predators in the river. But they do have pretty specific water tolerances and do prefer clean waters. 
and they don't tend to do as well when they're in competition with non-native fish. And again, they're fairly long-lived, 16 years or, or plus are known. Um, probably some of the species people are most interested in um, in the Merced River or the Merced River system are uh, native rainbow trout and central valley steelhead, um, Acarhicus micus. These guys, um, you know, have a little bit more of a convoluted history in the Merced River Canyon. Rainbow trout were commonly stocked um, using hatchery strained fish, mostly from the Merced River hatchery, but perhaps others. And you know, hatcheries didn't always weren't always picky about where their rainbow trout came from. So, you know, it's likely that rainbow trout from all over the state or perhaps the West Coast and as far away as British Columbia were used in hatchery operations and, and likely stocked between Foresta and into Lake McClure. So there's some mixing going on there. Um, Central Valley steelhead um, are a, a non-hatchery origin. Um, some of those genetics have shown up in some surveys that we've done um, with Mike Martin and others in sponsorship with uh, NOAA Fisheries. And we've actually sent fin clip samples into uh, Devin Pierce at NOAA, who's identified some fish in the main stem and in, in the region of the gorge, um, just inside the park line boundary, and in the South Fork near Wawona <clears throat> of the Merced, where it's showing, we don't know exactly the significance, but there are, are non-hatchery origin rainbow trout that might be considered Central Valley steelhead. Um, I have a question mark sort of next to, you know, what's considered a distinct population segment. Um, I won't go into all the gory details, but that's a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service definition for how important the genetics of that population of trout are. And I would say we still don't have an answer on that for Central Valley steelhead, which is a federally threatened species. Um, in the San Joaquin drainage system, but now that we have these identified non-hatchery origin rainbow trout, there's still a little bit more you know, science to be done on the genetics and the importance of the fish. And the context is really in, in the um, Exchequer Dam and Lakes McClure and McSwain. You know, since these fish are migratorily, you know, blocked from getting to the ocean or getting to those other populations to interbreed, um, those are the considerations that sort of leave that question mark. But genes responsible for timing of breeding have been shown now in rainbow trout um, that you can actually have hatchery fish and native fish um, co-occurring in the same water body, but they won't necessarily interbreed. And their genetics are actually cued into the timing of breeding that sort of maintains that separation of the genetics. So, um, and historically, a question that comes up, you know, how far if steelhead were in the system, did they range? Um, steelhead being much better jumpers than salmon, you know, it's possible they could have reached places like Yosemite Valley and the South Fork and Wawona um, prior to the construction of dams. Another, the next anadromous fish um, historically to occur in our region is the Chinook salmon or black salmon, um, Uncorhynchus shelvitia. Um, it's kind of a, a Russian species name in there. But the Merced River has a fall run, um, which is considered an evolutionary significant unit. So again, without going too deep into that, you can easily Google that if you want to learn more. But um, evolutionary significant units are, are, for salmon anyway, are kind of spread out between the runs or the season or the timing of the breeding. And um, you know, Mike Martin sent me a paper recently on the genetics that's been done on this, that they've actually found the gene or genes responsible for the timing of those migrations for the breeding. There, there is some overlap between the runs of the season, but um, it's largely genetically tied um, um, to that timing. So for us, we only have the, the fall run in the Merced River and you know historic distribution in the Merced River system. You know, this is a thing that's fascinated me throughout the Central Valley of, of California. I formerly worked on the Cosumnes River on the El Dorado National Forest, which is the only undammed river in this, one of the only undammed rivers in the state where um, Chinook still run and possibly get into higher elevations than they did than they can his, um, currently. And, you know, a lot of people have dug pretty deep trying to figure out how far salmon got up the Merced River system. And we have 
you know, anecdotal references like Mariposa region, um, you know, which I, to me is taken to be that area between Bagby and Briceburg. And if they got that far, they probably definitely got to El Portal reaches, but the gorge into Yosemite Valley was probably more difficult to navigate. Salmon tend to hit a maximum length, you know, around 30 inches, and then their, their bodies tend to grow deeper from their dorsal to their ventral, and they don't necessarily get longer, but they get heavier and bigger, um, and then be, and thus become less good at jumping. Um, and, you know, the oldest reference someone found for uh, the Luana area during the Gale and Clark days was, you know, a red-headed vulture eating a salmon carcass somewhere on the bank, um, but it's, again, probably unlikely that salmon reached as far as Wawona, but, you know, interested parties can actually, you know, you can actually look for marine derived nitrogen in really old trees. So if you had high concentrations of fish and you have really old trees, you can actually pulverize that wood and pull out the nitrogen and, and make inferences that some anadromous marine dwelling fish presumably occurred in the region. Um, and our most, Notable non-native species that occurs in the river section um, that we're largely focused on tonight is um, Micropterus dolomiu. This is the smallmouth bass. Um, there are multiple species of bass in Lake McClure, including um, black bass, spotted bass, largemouth bass. Smallmouth bass are, are really good about leaving reservoirs and getting in the upstream riverine habitat. They tend to do, other bass can do it, but smallmouth seem to be more adaptable to river-like conditions. And you've probably seen these in the river. They don't always have a red conspicuous eye, but their the end of their their tail fin or their caudal fin will usually have a black line all the way down. So when you see a fish swimming away and it has a, a black tipped tail, um, it's usually indicative of a smallmouth bass. And I'd say they're fairly common in the river. They probably ebb and flow like crayfish with, with high flows, they probably get pulsed out. And when flows return to normal, they probably um, re-enter the system from Lake McClure um, and can get as high as the El Portal reach. They have, they have not been found in Yosemite Valley yet. And I think that would take a direct transplant. It's something we're concerned about having so many bass in the system, but um, you know, we haven't seen that yet, but it has happened in other river systems where people have actively moved smallmouth bass into higher reaches where they traditionally fish for trout, but now that waters have become warmer, um, have introduced smallmouth bass. So getting into some of our um, amphibian species in the corridor, our, our most common um, and notable is, is the Sierra tree frog. Um, there's a lot of nomenclature that goes around this species that's always changing. Um, it's been Pacific chorus frog, Pacific tree frog. Um, people have identified specific genes for the foothill, so we now call it the Sierra tree frog. And you know, Hyliola may stick, it may not. You know, Sudacris was its former name, Sudacris regilla, um, now Sudacris sierra, and we'll see if that stays. But there's these tree frogs, um, Hyliola or Hyla occur globally, so they're on, on most every continent. They're very um, historically long lineage, and a lot of people study these frogs and interest. And you can see they're in this photo, their, their toe tips, those toe pads, sort of give them that characteristic of, of tree climbing ancestry, um, that they're really good at climbing walls. And in Yosemite Valley, they're even really good at climbing El Cap and are often found in the cracks and crevices high up on the wall. Yes. No, please, I, sorry, not now. Um, sorry for the interruption. Um, and they're very common on the West Coast from Baja to Alaska. And they have that distinct, you know, ribbit, ribbit call that if you, any Hollywood movie you ever watch, <clears throat> you know, they also refer to them as the Hollywood frog for, for having that typical frog call that everybody uses. Um, Western toads are a little less common. And as Iris boreas, formerly Bufa boreas, are, are still found um, along the river corridors, um, but probably not as common as they once were. And it's gonna be due to the, to the Highway 140 road, um, toads and roads um, don't always get along and you know, frankly often do not. So their abundance is still, they still can be found, but they're just not as common as they probably once were. Um, you know, one interesting note that we, our crews have discovered during uh, turtle trapping surveys is they, they seem to have a mechanism to delay breeding until post-peak flows and we don't, 
really associate many amphibians with doing that unless they're um, you know really aquatic related um, species that relate lay eggs in, in in accordance with the timing of river flows so the we've observed western toads breeding in the south fork in august before um, in really wet years which is kind of surprising most areas of the state you know these guys start breeding about this time of year in the central valley in december and january and kind of work their way up in elevation um, so to have this delayed breeding during post peak flows is really interesting and something relatively new to us um, foothill yellow-legged frog ranaboilii was probably once more distributed in much in many of our tributaries um, in the reaches from like crane creek and moss creek down and probably into the north fork and today only occurs in the Sherlock Creek drainage that we know of. And we're, we're actively collecting um, environmental DNA samples for this species and, and have not turned them up in any other tributaries um, in the Merced. So we're, we're down to Sherlock. Um, Sherlock Creek was impacted pretty negatively by the, um, the telegraph fire and bullfrogs sort of have invaded the lower reaches of Sherlock Creek. So we're, we're actively engaged with BLM and USGS, trying to come up with a strategy to, to maintain um, foothill yellow-legged frogs in Sherlock Creek by potentially removing or reducing bullfrog numbers and trying to boost um, yellow-legged frog numbers in that site. They're recently listed by the state of California as threatened and still being considered um, for federal listing under the Endangered Species Act. Um, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So one species we don't have in the river corridor yet in the Alpertal region, but we may soon, um, is the California red-legged frog. Um, they are a federally threatened species that formerly occupied Piney Creek, Smith Creek, and Jordan Creek in the areas of Greeley Hill and Coulterville. Um, we have since introduced them to Yosemite Valley in, in the park. And, you know, it could just be a matter of time before they start trickling downstream and actually finding their way into some of the tributaries um, in the Merced River and the El Portal to Bryceburg Reach, you know, and I would say maybe we're, you know, 10 to 15 years from that occurring, but, you know, I do expect that it could happen someday. And our, you know, our, again, famous invader, non-native species, the American bullfrog, Lithobates catesbiana. This is a very notorious, invasive, large predator of our native aquatic and amphibians. Um, and also a carrier of disease, the amphibian chytrid fungus will live on the backs of bullfrogs and can be transported um, from one area to another. And the bullfrogs don't necessarily succumb to the fungus. So that makes them even a, a worse offender for a spreader of the disease. Um, we successfully eradicated them from Yosemite Valley. And we did work with the Upper Merced Watershed Council about trying to identify areas along the Merced River um, where we might focus other eradication efforts. Um, you know, the Merced River strongholds today probably include, you know, the Briceburg area down the railroad flat and Heights Cove on the South Fork continues to be um, a hot spot for bullfrogs. And, you know, it, it seems to us since we've eradicated from Yosemite Valley that abundances have gone down, um, at least anecdotally at some points of the river, you know, most notably like the places that I swim that I just don't find them as abundant I did um, five to seven years ago, which is we were reaching full eradication in Yosemite Valley. So it's possible that the valley eradication has actually reduced the numbers, also could be partly responsible for these areas being colonized downstream in the first place. Um, but, you know, we don't know for sure, but we probably will focus on some of these areas in, in assisting other land managing agencies with trying to remove the bullfrogs to keep them out of the park, you know, for forever, hopefully. And, you know, they're a little bit different than our native amphibians. Most of our native amphibians get out um, in metamorphose in the same year in which the eggs were laid, but the bullfrog needs two years of permanent water for their tadpoles. So they do well in the river because they have that um, permanent water, but, you know, outside of that, where there's ephemeral systems, they don't seem to penetrate. So the good news is they seem to be concentrated along the river. <clears throat> um, I'll just do a check-in. That audio is still okay. Yes, sir. Sounds good. Thanks. All right. Thanks. So um, a couple folks me wanted to make sure that I didn't forget to mention are probably, um, you know, our 
most famous endemic of the Merced River Canyon, and, and that's the limestone salamander, Hydromanes brunus. Um, these salamanders are only endemic to the Merced River Canyon, meaning they don't occur anywhere else um, in the state or you know the country for that matter. Plethodonted salamanders or, or lungless salamanders are even more rare in sort of you know what we've defined as Mediterranean climates. They have to breathe through their skin, which means their skin has to be constantly kept moist. So they have very specific habitat requirements. They're only in wet permanent springs. Um, you know, these animals had to distribute somehow to get across the landscape and get into these very tight, wet niches. And, you know, that probably is, you know, a possible indicator that we had a wetter past um, when migration and, and persistence was a little bit easier if we were wet on a year round basis. Um, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that um, the limestone salamander has evolved from the Mount Lyle salamander, which is found in Yosemite Valley, but more commonly found on mountaintops, um, sort of, you know, true sky islands during glacial periods when, when mountain peaks were sticking through the glaciers, that's the habitat uh, Mount Lyle salamanders were persisting in uh, between glacial periods and then colonizing areas downstream. <clears throat> How they got to Yosemite Valley and the vicinity of uh, Bridal Vale Falls um, is still somewhat of a mystery. And you know how Brunus evolved um, from Platycephales, the Mount Lyle salamander is still not well worked out, but that's people's best genetic guess today is that they're descendants of the Mount Lyle salamander. Um, other notable features, they have very squared toes. If you ever had one crawl over your skin, you can actually feel those toes kind of digging into your skin because they're really adept at climbing wet vertical walls. Um, they also have a strong muscular tail that sort of aids in assisting them with that with climbing. So um, very special salamander um, endemic to the Merced River corridor. Um, next, moving on into the sort of similar genre, the, the Sierra Newt, um, Tarika Sierra. Um, this is our, our native newt that has been recently broken out into a, its own species. Um, the Sierra Newt versus the um, typical California Newt, which is found more broadly throughout California. Um, you know, just make a quick reference that newts and toads share a lot of similar characteristics and that they have more of a terrestrial life stage versus frogs and salamanders that tend to be heavily tied to water. Um, you know, newts and toads spend a large portion you know, of the year in underground burrows, perhaps only merging on, um, you know, at night or uh, during wet periods. Um, our newts are very uh, well known for the poisonous skin secretions they contain called tritototoxins. They, um, you know, if you harass them long enough, they'll start to exude um, this creamy substance from their skin. And, you know, a lot of people have studied this in a what's been termed an evolutionary arms race between newts and garter snakes. So um, garter snakes learn to develop resistance to eating toxic newts, and then the newts tend to get more toxic to ramp up their defenses against snakes. And then you sort of get these super toxic newts and super resistant snakes. Um, so it's a pretty interesting evolutionary relationship that's been studied for quite a while. Um, newts have been known to be pretty long lived, about 20 years plus. Um, much like the amphibian fungus that's attacking our yellow-legged frogs and our other native frogs in the species um, in the U.S. and throughout the world, there's a, a new invader that we're very much looking out for um, called Batrachochytridium salamandrivens. It's a B-sal for short. It's a newt or salamander-specific version of that amphibian fungus that has been found in other countries but not in the US yet. And I'm a little worried um, from early reports from Spain and other areas of U Europe where B-cell has um, hit hard, it's wiping out native salamanders and newts. So we're hoping it's not just a matter of time, but the, but the pet trade and, and introductions of this pathogen um, could have real repercussions for things like Sierra newts um, and Mount Lyle salamanders and uh, limestone salamanders. Um, if it were to enter California. So there's a lot of work being done at ports of entry like Los Angeles and San Francisco, um, sampling animals in the pet trade, looking for this new 
new pathogen. Um, our one and only endemic native turtle is the Western Pond Turtle, Emmys marmorata. Um, to me, this is a, a very cool turtle. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, if we only have one, this is actually a pretty cool species to have. Uh, they're a long-lived turtle, about 50 to 60 years. They, we do find them and, and trap them occasionally in the river, um, but they don't seem to be in very high abundance. And again, that's probably largely related to the roads or Highway 140 in, in the system, you know, when nesting females have to come out on land, cross roads to breed, um, you know, it's just not as favorable along that river canyon to do that. Um, more, they are, they are more common in the North Fork and the South Fork Mercedes where there are, you know, obviously roadless areas where they tend to fare a little bit better. So, all right, I'm freezing up again, so apologies. Okay, so moving on to American beaver, Castor canadensis. Um, you know, we have an unknown history for these species in the Merced River, um, but it slowly found its way back into the upper Merced system. Um, we don't have any historic records for Yosemite Valley and areas in the park, but it's not surprising. A lot of the trapping happened in the early 1800s, you know, but long before people were recording areas like Yosemite Valley. Beavers were probably already extirpated from trapping for fur. Um, they are still pretty common below McClure and Lakes McSwain. And Jan van Wankendonk was one of the first El Portal residents to start seeing beavers or evidence of beavers in the Merced River in the El Portal region in the late 1970s. And, you know, I just did some, you know, rough math knowing these beaver dispersal patterns of about two to three miles per year and you know seeing an El Portal in the 1970s and Yosemite Valley in the 1990s um, kind of fits well they were heavily trapped and protected um, after that in like the 1940s in California so you know following that time frame if they actually started to do better and actually expand their range back up the Merced River system um, it, it kind of coincides so um, today they appear to be well established in the River Canyon and you know, there is still some debate swirling on whether they are native or not native or should be here or should not. And, you know, as a general rule of thumb, I usually consider if a species has found its way back into presumably historic or native habitat and they're making a decent living, that that's often a pretty good precursor that, you know, they probably were here historically. Um, they just went unrecorded or unnoticed, you know, obviously for the strong trapping history, um, in California known for beaver. And then and lastly, just, just wrapping up, you know, sort of at the top of the food chain is the Amer North American river otter, Lantra canadensis. Um, again, these guys are pretty well established down in the San Joaquin River and the in the lower Merced River. They're even a common observation in, in the city of Merced from what I understand. And, you know, our first observation came during the drought. Um, it was near the Artrock entrance station near the Cookie where um, a climber was swimming and, and thought they saw an otter and we got interested and started setting up some trail cameras and started getting our detections. Um, you know, our, our recent estimates from some work being done with partners down at San Diego State are estimating, you know, between the South Fork, probably to Lake McClure to Yosemite Valley, we have about four to 10 otters ranging in that vicinity. Um, they were doing sort of caloric estimates for how much an otter would need to eat and sustain and came up with an abundance estimate of about four to ten otters um, and they you know today they appear to be well established in the Merced River system we thought maybe after the drought and conditions in the lower river system returned to sort of you know more normal conditions that the otters might leave the area but they seem to be persisting and staying um, and question that commonly comes up you know is there an association with beaver um, that has sort of led to the presence of otter in the Merced River system. And there is a lot of literature to suggest that there is a relationship, a strong relationship between beavers and otter, but we don't always exactly know what it is. Um, you know, our beavers don't create the typical habitat of building dams and creating large ponded wetlands behind them, but they are a bank dweller um, and they dig pretty nice large tunnel banks and burrows into the sides of the river that the otters also prefer. Um, and then, you know, I don't think otters are good housemates. I think they tend to 
kick the beavers out or perhaps use abandoned beaver dens. Um, but it could be that we have river otters in here because the beavers are now well so well established that the river otters can actually take up residency in those beaver dens. So, um, so a couple things that, that Mikey asked me to talk about were just sort of the River Canyon, you know, as sort of both a wildlife migratory corridor. And I would like to also talk about, you know, what are probably, you know, currently in historic migrations barriers to aquatic wildlife. Um, you know, most notably the Highway 140 road running along the river is, is perilous to a lot of amphibian species. There's unfortunately no shortage in the, in the literature about roads and the impacts on amphibians. Um, but, but, you know, going back a little bit further into the history, you know, when we had the railroad grade going through, you can imagine, um, this is not one of our native salamanders on the left, but you can imagine railroad tracks being a pretty impenetrable barrier to amphibian species. So I think it's definitely been a victory on, on the trail side that's being considered, you know, where the railroad grade has now been removed or the infrastructure has been removed, I should say that, you know, we, we've taken down a pretty significant barrier. Um, there's a lot of, <clears throat> or I'd say a decent amount of literature of a lot of reptiles and amphibians getting trapped um, sort of within railroad tracks. You know, they make it over the first one, but then they kind of get stuck and get confused in which way to go and they tend to desiccate, dry out. Um, so in that sense, you know, the, re the removal of that infrastructure has probably removed a pretty significant barrier um, for a lot of dispersing amphibians that need to get to the river. And I should just mention that, you know, since we, we don't have a lot of um, ponded off-channel wetlands along the river that most of the species, um, if not all that I've talked about tonight, are 100% reliant on the river, you know, sort of those post-peak flows for, to complete their breeding cycle. So they do have to migrate, you know, across the, the road or across the trail to get to the river for, or to complete their, their life cycle. Um, some of you may remember there was, you know, ABC News out of Sacramento came down and did a story on on the newts locally in El Portal. You know, it was, it was a newts and road story and, you know, sort of the perilous crossing, you know, for newts. Um, and we, we looked at Incline Road at El Portal and it's um, an area that I monitor quite frequently. Um, and I know a lot of, there's a few local residents that do post signs during the migration period, which is luckily pretty short, usually between January and February on, you know, mostly warm rainy nights when these newts are crossing the road um, that people are on the lookout for them. And, and you know, breeding wrapping up in March and April. So, you know, it's luckily this is a pretty short window that these impacts are occurring, um, but, you know, newts are absent in Yosemite Valley and we don't know if that's related to the road densities. Um, historically, bullfrogs, bullfrogs don't seem to be, don't succumb to the newt toxins. So, um, you know, we've noticed other amphibian declines related to bullfrog presence. So, you know, we don't, have a lot of good data about where newts historically occurred. Unfortunately, they're they're gone from some areas of Yosemite Valley in the park. Um, I figured it was good. Another question was just to um, pose that I address is sort of how the park has um, assisted other projects for um, issues related to roads or trails and amphibian passage. Um, Sonora Pass, Highway 108, has been a, a notorious sort of um, depth section of road for Yosemite toes. There's no easy way to put it. It's just a Caltrans does a really good job of plowing the road, getting it open. Um, there's tall snow banks, you know, and then there's the road. So toads crawl over the snow, they fall into the road bay, the road bed, they can't escape, and then they're overrun by traffic. Um, so uh, Caltrans biologists, in coordination with the Humboldt Toyabi, designed the structure that I, I helped give input for, which is, you know, to put drift fences along the road and actually give the toads um, some areas of passage. So this is a um, sort of a toad tunnel being, um, you know, constructed here and placed on Sonora Pass, um, which they identified was one of the hot spots. So they, you know, based on that road mortality, unfortunately, finding to dead toads on the road, they were actually able to identify the hot spots where most of the toads were crossing where they could in install these structures. 
Um, a similar event transpired on Sierra National Forest um, a couple of years ago during an off-highway event um, that unfortunately coincided with a, an episodic thunderstorm and about 150 Jeeps traveling down a Forest Service road in the middle of a migration storm. Um, the toads were basically triggered to move during the rain event and, you know, described by the biologist, it was kind of a slaughter. Um, but it was really on a very short section of road. So they were, again, able to identify a very specific hot spot where the um, mass amount of mortality was occurring and sort of develop this, um, this toad bridge, as they nicknamed it, which is, you know, just some wood structures. Um, I think it was a $30,000 total project cost, not too expensive, um, where toads could sort of migrate under the road. And they monitored that with uh, trail cameras and motion sense sensing cameras to detect toads actually using the underpassage to get crossed um, during rain events. In the park, um, we specifically have dealt with um, some trail related issues, again, with Yosemite toads. Um, we don't have a lot of frog, newt, or salamander issues with trails or roads, but we tend to have a few issues um, with the Yosemite toads and trails. And that's largely because trails, historically, they were constructed in meadows because meadows are the first place to melt out. So it makes, you know, it made a lot of sense historically that whenever you could route a trail through a meadow because it's going to be the, the first thing to open up. But um, in this example, this is Carrick Meadow within the, within the park. This is a Yosemite toad breeding um, pond, an ephemeral wetland, um, sort of on the majority of the screen, and you can see the trail traversing through the left. So in situations like this, we, we proposed um, several alternatives. We were either one is doing a full reroute through the rocky terrain that you can see on the, on the right-hand side of the photo, Um, or we consider, you know, other less impactful um, mitigations as sort of an elevated causeway. Um, you know, on the left, this is something that's been done in, in, in Truckee Meadows. And then, or you could do something as simple as just placing wood structures either temporarily or year round to allow or reduce that impact of animals to still migrate um, without directly stepping on them. And this is an example on the right from somewhere back in the Appalachian Mountains that has done it. Um, for migrating salamanders. And, and, you know, part of the project, you know, thinking about, you know, the considerations or things that might come up and, you know, is, is having good data to sort of inform or have good science to form the decisions that you're making. Um, you know, a lot of the examples I, I have given are very point specific um, related to amphibian wildlife migration hotspots. Um, and a lot of others do this across the country when either addressing roads or trails um, is to get that data, you know, find out where these areas um, are, are most susceptible for amphibians crossing. Um, you know, I've seen examples on Incline Road, um, you know, the new collision hotspots tend to be, you know, near stream and tributary crossings, for example. Um, and even in near my house, um, in mid pines, we've seen similar rain events trigger migrations of western toads um, moving from one area to another where they have very specific areas that they seem to like to cross the road. And, you know, I think one of the best examples, I just pulled up iNaturalist, and this is, you know, be something to consider. And I think this is mostly, mostly Beth Pratt's data um, for newts along the corridor, but you know, getting data to figure out where your hotspots are along the trail um, would be a great first step. And, you know, I would suggest probably sticking with something like iNaturalist to get you um, that usable data, um, you know, to, to, to sort of hone in on what your areas of concern um, might look like and, you know, whether a specific structure or crossing needs to be designed and to reduce that mortality. Um, or, you know, you know, perhaps um, using very specific signage, um, seasonal closures. As I mentioned, the newts have a very specific breeding timing correlated to rains, mostly during January, February. So maybe you, you know, re reduce or restrict the type of uses, um, you know, to reduce the impacts or, you know, some monitoring that goes along with a trigger, you know, any host of um, actions, you know, that you may be able to implement, including signage as, as example here, um, where in, 
On the left in British Columbia, toads migrate out of Lost Lake in the tens of thousands. So they set up these closures. They have volunteers come out and educate the public or assist the toads migrating over the road or temporarily shut it down if they need to. Um, and I think this can be quite effective. You know, I think you have a lot more leverage, freedom and flexibility in a, in a trail situation than you do with the road. Um, to control that use in traffic. So um, and there's lots of good examples. I can definitely share the ones that I came across. Um, last two slides, I just wanted to talk about a couple issues that have been brought to my attention um, in the River Canyon that people thought I probably should just mention. Um, if you've seen driving on the Highway 140 corridor, these sort of white striped lines as indicated on the left, um, you know, this is a new brining method that Caltrans is implementing um, in the canyon in, in the Briceburg grade where they're actually applying this brine solution and they they apply it as a solution versus a powder um, because the brine sticks better to the road. Um, unfortunately, that means it sticks better to your car and other things, um, but it's meant to act as a de-icer prior to um, black ice setting up on the roadway. And there's been some literature um, certainly to suggest where, where road salting or brining occurs that there's impacts to native aquatic wildlife um, and I, I will be the first to admit I don't know or can't say exactly because I don't have the figures on how much is being applied or or the exact chemical um, it's not always sodium chloride um, it's going to be sodium bromide or, or another derivative that's being applied to the road surface as a de-icer um, or what those um, ecological effects might be. You know, something for the limestone salamander that only occurs in a very specific, you know, seep and wetland, you know, something like road brining could have, you know, increased consequences for them if, if it were to get washed into their habitat and they come in direct contact with it. Um, second is, is some of you may have heard about um, this new urban runoff mortality syndrome. Um, as far as I know, this is this mostly affects coho and to some degree rainbow trout, um, but there's a ozone antioxidant um, called 6-PPD quinone that's applied to rubber and tires to prevent them from oxidizing too quickly, too quickly um, which basically increases tire longevity. Um, and it basically is known to leach from new and used tire wear and studies have shown that in um, coho, at least, it can cause up to 40 to 90% mortality in out migrating juveniles. So, you know, another thing to be, you know, sort of concerned about um, is this new toxicant from tires. And I don't know how the industry will deal with it, but I was just asked to sort of mention it. Um, and particularly that um, the, the leachants from used tires proved to be more lethal to rainbow trout um, than legions from brand new tires. So, you know, there's at least mounting evidence that tire chemicals getting into waterways um, is having a pronounced effect mostly on fishes. Um, so I'm sorry to end on that, <clears throat> excuse me, sort of um, down note, but, you know, I do want to make observations, um, you know, having been in the park for seven years, I've heard numerous reports from um, locals in the area, how they perceive the continuing health of the Merced River to be improving um, from the native aquatic invertebrates um, emerging to, you know, the improvement of the fisheries. Um, it's just a lot of signs, at least anecdotally, and I don't study the Merced River that much outside of the park, you know, it seemed to indicate that the river is um, seemingly on a really healthy trajectory um, and in improving year by year. And that's in the face of, you know, catastrophic floods and fires and runoff from those fires, um, that this river system seems to be extremely resilient. And it's, you know, it's really great news to see native species like uh, Western pearl shell mussels increasing in abundance and river otters and beavers seemingly making a happy living and, you know, fishermen being happy and um, you know, it just seems like it's a really good time for the river. So uh, with that, I would just like to thank you for having me tonight and, and entertain any questions that may have come up during my presentation. 
Uh, right on, Rob. Thank you so much. Um, that was gripping. And uh, if you were following the chat, which um, maybe you were, maybe you were focused on your slides, you'll you would see that everybody is uh, essentially clapping through the chat at your um, at your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, there are a couple questions that uh, I can read to you, um, many of which you have uh, kind of touched on a little bit um, in your presentation. But um, if you could expand a little bit, or, or, or if not, no worries. But um, a couple couple of questions really stand out here. Uh, the first was, um, do you think that increased recreation along the Merced River will aid in knowledge of wildlife presence or absence uh, and could potentially increase wildlife research and or management activities? Uh, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Jessica, for that question. Hello. Um, I do. I'm actually pretty excited to get more citizen science um, campaigns along the Merced River. So for me, I, I, I do think that or I do hope that increased recreation along the Merced River will add to more observations that we can track in either iNaturalist or get. Um, you know, we've had wanting to continue our bullfrog um, monitoring along the river and hopefully, you know, having a little bit um, more access will, will get us more observations on areas that we need to focus. Um, a lot of people that hike the sections um, already, that's where our best otter observation data come from, um, beaver observations as well. So yes, I, I do think that increased recreation along the river would, it, would increase our knowledge base um, for aquatic wildlife species and hopefully terrestrial as well. Cool, thank you. Um, and as you mentioned, obviously we're, we're going to go and already are a little bit over um, and that's cool with us obviously. Uh, and um, if folks have to leave uh, before we're finished here, all the information that we'll share, the rest of the presentation will be available online on, on the county's website and also on the events Facebook page. Um, so if you have to leave, Totally understand, and thanks for coming. And uh, we'll we'll check in with you later. Uh, okay, next question for Rob: What, if any, impacts could be created or increased for aquatic wildlife with increased non-motorized use of the Merced River Trail? And how could those impacts be mitigated? And it's kind of a big question. Um, but if you have any anything to summarize or anything, any other quick reactions to that question, that'd be great. Yeah, I I think you know any increase traffic or, or the, you know, um, expansion of, of use could, could lead to increased erosion and sediment getting into the river. And you'd probably want to make sure um, those actions were, were mitigated or, or reduced as much as possible. Um, you know, there are some areas within the park um, that we, we even know trails are designated non-motorized. Some users still find their way onto those trails and you know we call it trespass and the impacts do occur so you know i would say either increased um you know deterrent methods or you know i don't want to put it on david greenwood or others to have increased presence in some areas but you know making sure that you know the use stays um or the user group stay to the ones that you've identified and you know not allow the motorized traffic would probably create a lot of increased erosion along the trail you know it's something you know it doesn't sound like you're planning for but you know it's something that still may tend to happen um, as people try to gain access to those areas um, with motorized equipment that you don't want to that could have those additional impacts so just being aware that that that's something that could that could transpire um, but it, you know i think having good controlled erosion measures in place to not increase sediment into the river would be the one, you know, most worth considering, um, I think. Cool, and obviously a number of other countermeasures or mitigations that you mentioned as far as the toad bridge and uh, other strategies um, in your presentation. Um, Next question, uh, as we've seen from studies of other trail projects, increased recreation can not only increase direct mortality for animals like the Sierra Newt, but also cause animals to avoid the area over time uh, and disrupt migration and travel patterns. New populations in other areas where trails have been put in have disappeared as a result. In your work in the park, how would a new trail development, new, new trail project or development in Yosemite be evaluated given these significant ecological concert, uh, ecological consequences? 
So how would a new trail project? Yeah. Okay, you got it. Yeah, I'd follow it along with you. <laughs> it's still it's still helpful for you to read it. Okay. Um, in case it's good, but but yes, um, you know we're we're in planning efforts in the park. I I would say, um, you know we're largely focused on Yosemite Toad for a lot of trail reroutes. Um, in the wilderness stewardship plan, which is a plan that's kind of gone on hold, but but may come back to the surface, you know, sometime in the near future. And we've identified, you know, several areas within the park where we definitely want to reroute trails to get them out of Yosemite toad habitat. The, the toad is a little bit trickier than the newt, perhaps, because um, toads in general have been showed to have sort of an affinity for disturbance. <laughs> they tend to um be attracted to disturbed areas so some some sometimes when you actually put in a trail you can actually increase their use of that area because the trail may actually pond more water than it did prior to its construction um you know one of the things looking at you know several maps and images of google earth you know historically my guess would be that most of the merced river canyon between foresta Elpertal down to the Bryceburg area, you know, newts were probably more heavily distributed on the on the on the south side of the road, you know, where where it wasn't as sunny. Um, you can see that from the vegetation differences um, versus south facing slopes, um, which is where the trail largely occurs now. Um, so it's it's difficult to say. There there are still obviously newts that occur in fairly good abundance um, on that north side of the river or that south facing slope, but my my inclination is that it was probably the newts were denser on the side where the road is currently. Um, and, you know, evaluating what those impacts could be. I, I really like this concept of, of identifying, you know, the hotspots, like actually getting real data, you know, whether it's a survey form that people pick up at the beginning of the trail that they can mark off um, to identify where these concentrations might be and just you know quickly looking at your data beth you know from my naturalist you know it seems like right at the trailhead there's a really high concentrated new use of that area you know um so would signage alone be enough perhaps not but you know maybe with that trail dips over a couple of drainages um you know that those are elevated causeways or you know small um, crossing structure like a bridge is erected you know i think those things would help um unfortunately some of the ideas that we consider in the park get a little bit more complicated um you know since we're working in wilderness so i like elevated causeways but you know wilderness staff tend to not like them because they're an eyesore um you know so i think you have a little more flexibility to be creative with you know structures that might reduce impact that you know could avoid foot traffic by having newts and other aquatic species pass under um you know something like an elevated causeway cool um thanks rob quick follow-up to your response to the first question at what point regarding the um uh data collection and the capacity for the trail to um encourage people to um to collect data or to have a better understanding of the ecological conditions they're traveling through uh, at what point does the destruction of habitat and wildlife because of increased recreation outweigh the added observations you uh, that from the the benefit research? And then um, a similar question: uh, the need for toad bridges and other mitigation is proportional to the level of use, right? Uh, how much use is too much use? Um, so, sort of synthesizing those two questions um, regarding use limitations. Yeah, I think that's that would be again related. If you could if you could get the data, you know that would be great. You know, I just I had similar observations like on the Heights Cove Trail where you tend to get new density increasing the further you go from the beginning of that trailhead, right? So you could you could deduce that, you know, is it the road impacts, you know, which are known to show amphibian reductions um, within a corridor uh, of a roadway or is it that you know 90 percent of the people hike the first you know quarter or half a mile and then turn around and head back and maybe that's where the impacts are occurring um, i think since you have a pretty defined migra migra migration period most of the newts are probably moving at night 
um, and that slower foot traffic, you know, you know, eyes on the ground, you know, could get you a lot more information. And if you have evidence and see direct mortality from from trampling, um, you know, newts are not going to be probably as easily scavenged, you know, by um, other things like raccoons as easily due to their toxic skin nature that, you know, I would think you'd be able to document that, that if there's increased trade-off, and I would, I would admit that there is going to be a trade-off between, you know, how much use is giving you that knowledge or beneficial knowledge back to you. Um, but in this context, I would actually strongly recommend that, that you use that knowledge, you know, in a feedback loop to make that determination. And if, you know, if there's unaccepted or unacceptable levels of, of mortality occurring, then, you know, maybe you really re would have to implement a trail closure from all use. Um, you know, I, I see it being a little bit more difficult for horseback riding and mountain biking to be as vigilant about not, you know, obstructing or, or running over individuals that maybe you have sections you have to walk, you know, your bicycle through to get through that hot spot. But I, I think as a first step, identifying where those areas are and considering, you know, signage, um, you know, limited closure periods during peak breeding, you know, and this is the great data that we've gotten behind a lot of our other project is just, you know, finding out when do they breed? When are they moving around? Are they more common at night or during the day? You know, and, and having citizens, you know, involved with collecting the science and the data could actually get you, you know, sort of that refinement you need to properly um, implement mitigations, I, I would say. Is that a long-winded answer? No, it's, <laughs> that's very inspiring. I think, the, I think we all are excited. A lot of people certainly are excited about the idea of increased um, citizen science and opportunities for stewardship. Uh, in general, not not speaking specifically about the river trail just um, in our community. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Rob, considering that the proposed Merced River Trail runs along an existing disturbed area, the railroad grade, and is adjacent to a highway, uh, do you think, sorry, I lost it, do you think that the increased recreational traffic concerns are equal to those of a newly constructed or rerouted trail? No, that's a great question. Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I, I neglected to ask whether you've done, you know, sort of any um, future assessments that you think these trail improvements would, you know, lead to X number of increased visitation, you know, or, or enhancement. But, um, you know, I, I think that's, that's a great question to be asked. I think, you know, having hiked um, many sections of that trail, you know, um, with family members, you know, we often come to a barrier, you know, a rock slide or something, and that's our our point to turn around. And, you know, if we, you know, do slight improvements to the trail where it increases that, you know, access a little bit further along, you know, will those sort of impacts be exacerbated? And I, you know, working in some, working in a place like Yosemite Valley, where we have, you know, millions of visitors and thousands of people on trails, like, um, you know, I've been struggling trying to figure out like what what your increased usage look like, and you know, maybe it's a system that you, um, you know, I don't know if you would ever have a quota system for a trail like this, but you know, some of the most impactful areas that I monitor in the in the park or that I consider to be impactful, um, you know. One of the struggles is if we reroute that trail, are we going to have more of an impact or are we going to truly reduce the impact? Um, you know, those are largely unknowns until you try. And I would say in this case, it, it might largely be the same. You know, it's it's hard to predict that, you know, that increased or the perceived increase in traffic is going to lead to direct increases in wildlife trampling or wildlife effects. Um, having the existing corridor there, I'd say people are pretty free to access, um, you know, large sections of it that I don't see it being very different. Um, I don't, I don't anticipate that you're going to see increases in magnitude. You know, maybe if you're going from dozens of hikers, are you really going to go to, to hundreds of hikers in a day on these trails? And again, you know, having the impact window minimized, at least for aquatic species, you know, maybe just that dictates to you how vigilant you need to be at just very certain times of the year, you know, 
Um, I don't see a lot of potential for impact, you know, from April, probably, you know, nowadays until November. So there's just probably just a short window that you're really asking these questions about when are these impacts most likely to occur and how to implement mitigations to address them. So, yeah, it's a great question. I don't have the obvious answer, um, but it's a good point that it is an existing trail. How much increased impact will there be? I don't know you can say for sure. Cool. Well, um, thank you so much, Robin. Um, I uh, so I mentioned this in the chat, but in the interest of time, we're gonna um, we're gonna move on uh, to the rest of the kind of evening and the discussion around the workshop activity. But if anybody has any additional questions that they want to pass on, want, want would like Rob to answer, um, feel free. I left my email address in the chat box, um, and you can just email them to me, and I will make sure to pass them on um, to Rob and and help kind of. Is that okay, Rob? If I can kind of be the middleman between you and the your adoring fans. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Uh, okay, um, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna press on to our discussion around the project goals. Um, so we mentioned uh, earlier, just a reminder that um, oh, and I should also add uh, that Rob's presentation will also be available if this is okay, Rob. I forgot to ask you, but. Um, Hopefully, we'll be able to share Rob's presentation, just the slide deck, um, with our kind of summary materials. Um, we'll certainly, uh, again, have the whole presentation recorded and available to watch back later. Um, but yeah, so uh, previous meeting, uh, previous meetings uh, and and activities, we established our project vision. We're now to the point where we're trying to think through ways that uh, we can recommend uh, goals that are going to be instrumental in realizing that vision. Um, and to and we'll be following a similar kind of methodology as we did with the vision, where uh, the working group um, works to uh, amongst themselves to discuss uh, options and 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 sort of a variety of different uh, ways of of expressing the the uh, different visions for the river trail. Uh, the community selects uh, from and edits and modifies and engages with those draft goals that the working group. Um, uh, kind of presents and the uh, kind of feedback and input from those discussions go back to uh, the, the committee and the committee uh, helps sort of synthesize the community feedback into final goals. So um, the uh, these were so previously when working with the vision there were three draft vision statements um, in, in terms of the project goals since there will be more goals than vision statement uh, the, the working group is proposing, these 11 draft goals, and when I say they're proposing, I mean they're offering these as sort of conversation stimulators uh, for you all to engage with, um, and and we'll we'll get to the, the sort of engagement component of it in a minute. But um, they're 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 important. Uh, the these are the product of months of dialogue and and hard work from our committee, uh, and these are meant to um, your task will be uh, to kind of um, not necessarily select which of these you like, but to um, to use these as a starting point for um, for either crafting your own draft goals or um, uh, modifying or editing selectively from these individual draft goals to come up with the draft goals that um, the goals that you think are most important for this project. Um, so uh, I'm I'm not going to read through all of them, but uh, here they are, and um, what you're task will be is to uh, engage with them through this online survey, which uh, is the link to which is now in the chat box, but also will be available in other places, uh, Facebook and, and email, etc. But um, this survey, uh, again, you know, we would be, you know, con conducting this activity in person, but since we're not, we're going to be having it take place online. And um, what, what we think is also, what we hope is going to be uh, uh, compelling or effective with this is that, you know, you can obviously uh, participate in this survey whenever you want. It'll be up for about a month um, and and certainly something that can be shared and, and uh, folks can participate in at their leisure. Uh, but I'm going to just kind of, you know, and hopefully it's quite intuitive, but I'll sort of walk you through it a little bit just so that folks are familiar with it and, and you can complete this. Um, when, when you'd like to. 
So uh, basically, the, the survey opens up, and it uh, every single one of those draft goals is on a screen, and you can select whether or not you fully disagree with, um, don't think is you. You can evaluate the goal for the extent to which you like it. Basically, either you all the way from you totally disagree with, and um, that another one would be that this is a total priority goal for you. So you'll you'll complete that for all of the um, the the draft goals. And um, once, if you, the, the goals that you score either uh, as, so on the next screen, the goals that you score either that you like it a lot or that you think it should be a priority will automatically populate on the next screen and you'll be in a position to rank them. So if uh, of the, you know, three, let's say you select three goals as either a four or five, um, as, a pri as a priority of four or five, um, you can then indicate here uh, which of those is like a A1, with a bullet, your number one priority goal, and rank the goals that you think are most important uh, to give a sense to give us a sense of what you think are the the really key uh, priority things to emphasize. Um, you can also just enter additional comments on the priority goals, uh, just kind of free form uh, if you have any. Similarly, uh, if you have any goals that you think are are really terrible uh, that you really disagree with or, or really feel strongly aren't should not be priorities. Those will populate here on the next screen. So any goals that you indicate uh, a one or a two will be automatically uh, uh, left here for you to just provide comments on and tell us why you think they're such um, uh, unattractive goals for you. Uh, then there's some free form kind of open-ended questions where if there are any goals that aren't represented uh, or any ideas that the draft goals that the committee helps develop uh, are not are not effectively communicating or conveying, you can enter those. And then in general, if you have any other feedback that you want to share um, about the River Trail project or uh, the, the planning effort, you can enter that in this um, this last kind of empty text box. Um, you can also, uh, if you're not already on the distribution list for the email uh, that we, emails that we send out from time to time, um, you can enter that here in this email uh, slot. And we'll add you to the distribution list. Uh, so again, uh, here's that link. Um, it, it will. It, this presentation will be available online uh, to after the, the the actual PDF of this presentation will be available online after tonight, and um, you can just click on this. But again, it's also uh, in the chat box and will be posted on Facebook and emailed out to folks. Um, so over, I wanted to give you just a, a sense of kind of where we're going. Then, so once the the goal or how I guess how we'll use this information once. The survey has been up for uh, approximately a month. Um, we'll, we'll collect all the input that folks have entered into it, and um, the community working group will evaluate it, and um, based on what the overall kind of consensus is or the decisions, the, the, the feedback that you all shared, uh, we'll, we'll vote to adopt specific draft goals um, uh, to, I guess, turn draft goals into specific adopted goals. Uh, at which point uh, we'll we'll then have a vision and a set of goals, and we'll move on to um, a similar process to um, specify what the specific sort of project actions uh, are, which are going to be recommendations um, for ways that we can, you know, actual projects, actual actual on the ground or or policy or programmatic things that we can do to um, to realize the to to implement these goals that are necessary for achieving uh, the vision. Um, and so we'll, you know, th that, that will take some time and we'll be, uh, kind of the working group will be working on, um, once the, the goals have been decided, developing those draft actions, uh, to, to get out to you all for further discussion and evaluation, but there's a bunch of ways to stay connected, um, to this project and provide input outside of this meeting and outside of, um, the meetings around the project actions, uh, specifically, um, on January 7th, uh, we're going to have more of an open house type uh, online activity. So similar format, but um, geared towards really just providing, you know, obviously there's not a lot of opportunity through the format that we have tonight for a lot of questions and answers about the, the trail planning process and, and, um, and, and just general questions about the, the effort. Um, so the on January 7th from 4.30 to 5.30, we'll be having a, a an event geared towards that, where um, members certainly of the El Portal and Incline um, and forestic communities uh, and potentially elsewhere, folks 
you know, are interested, but, but primarily for the community members that are most affected by the trail uh, to um, ask questions of uh, county staff and the community working group, uh, just to, to, to have a, a more, um, just an opportunity to get more clarity on the project. Uh, and then also um, from 12 to 1 for the next three days from Tuesday on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, um, I'll be hosting what were basically office hours where people can, I'll just be in the Zoom, the, uh, I guess not really Zoom, it's the, the go-to meeting room, but I'll just be um, there. And if anybody wants to uh, drop by and chat about the project or or ask any questions of me or, or if there's anything I can do to help uh, clarify or, or, or just chat about this project with you, I'll, I'll just be there. So um, this is kind of the uh, the equivalent of coming by the planning department offices, um, but you know, adapted for a pandemic setting. So um, feel free to pop in. Uh, I should mention that uh, I'm now chatting uh, the link to attend both the, of these events. It's the same link as uh, the link that you used to get to this meeting. Um, so uh, uh, on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday from 12 to 1, uh, if you're interested in coming, please just uh, drop by and, and I'll be there. And if you're not, no worries. I'll just be eating lunch. Um, and same uh, for this January 7th event. Uh, that, that More details for that will be released. But just if you wanted to get it on your calendar uh, and save this link, uh, that's where we'll be. Um, so uh, final notes, just like I've emphasized it lots of times, but just wanted to be super clear that all of this will be available online after the meeting. Uh, not tonight, but um, tomorrow or the next day. This will all be, you know, put on Facebook and and put on the county's website and emailed out to folks. Um, so these materials will be. Uh, we we really hope that people find this uh, informative and, and engaging and want to um, participate and share their thoughts. And um, we'll try to make that as easy as and accessible as we can. But also encourage you all to, um, if there's anybody that we're not reaching, uh, you know, send them the link, send them the materials, and make sure that. You know, share this with your friends and the people that you're um, that that you think are going to be interested in this project because uh, the more the merrier. Um, our next meeting will be in the spring uh, at some point. So um, th our next, I guess, sort of community speaker and engagement series event will will be in the spring. Um, so if you wanted to sign up for our email address, our our, our listserv through uh, the survey, um, uh, that would be a great way to stay connected. You could also just email me your email address or however you'd like to stay involved, and I can add you to that distribution. Uh, we're also on Facebook, like I mentioned. Um, and uh, yeah, there's my email address, um, and uh, it's also in the chat. So um, the, that's the, the, the premise of the event, and we appreciate all your time. Uh, and uh, please enjoy the rest of your evening, and be safe out there, and look for um, these materials to be online soon. So thanks very much, uh, and take care.